Thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you. I've been enjoying the conversations we've been having, and I'm looking forward to a Q&A time after this. Uh, during the talk, I'm going to focus mostly on the uh, ways we're giving computing skills of emotion, emotional intelligence. Uh, but during the Q&A, I hope we can talk a lot more about how it connects up to the uh, spiritual life. And I'll try to bridge it with some of the flourishing. It's a little dangerous to do what I'm about to do, but I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes and imagine that you're not here. All right, dangerous, I know, after dinner, long day. Uh, now, I want you to imagine that you are whatever place you go when you've got a really critical deadline and you need to focus and you're working hard. And while you're in that place working really hard, this office or this hideaway place, uh, this character barges in and interrupts you and doesn't apologize and doesn't notice that you're a little bit annoyed by this interruption. Uh, and then he offers you useless advice. And at this point, you express a little bit more annoyance. Uh, and you all are all probably pretty polite, so it's probably pretty mild, but he doesn't get it. He just completely ignores it. And in fact, he continues this behavior uh, until the clarity of your emotional expression escalates. Now, in some places where I work, that involves a finger or other really inappropriate, awful things. Um, I imagine here you might scowl at the person or maybe even directly say something, but he ignores it. And this goes on until you've had enough and you just explicitly let this individual know that you've got work to do um, and could they, you know, that they're really not being helpful and to please go away. Uh, well, you can open your eyes now because um, what we see is that he goes away, um, but before he goes away, he winks at you, he does a happy little dance. Uh, and he looks like this. I'm curious if anybody in this audience remembers this character. All right, a bunch of you do. Um, by the way, this was one of the smartest AIs that was first deployed. Uh, it was deployed by Microsoft, the office assistant. Uh, Bill Gates got a standing ovation when he said it was going away. <laughs> now, was it a dumb AI? Was it, actually, it was brilliant at knowing if you were writing a letter or what you were doing. It used advanced machine learning before most people even like had heard of that. Uh, but what did it do that annoyed people? One of the things it did is it just didn't read your emotions. When we scowl at even a dog, the dog kind of puts its tail down and knows that it's been bad. But this thing like, could make you mad, you could show you were mad, and it would just act like everything was fine. Uh, when there's a time to ignore that and there's a time to respond to it, and when it escalates, it should do the equivalent of putting its tail down and its ears back and looking sorry, and it didn't do that. Uh, this winking happy little dance thing, well, that's great if you're testing new software and you're having fun in the lab, getting paid a lot to be in this modern facility testing cool new software. It's totally dumb when a person is under duress, major deadline, and you're interfering with their ability to get that done. Uh, so with ideas of what emotional intelligence would do, I wrote a book decades ago now called Affective Computing, and the idea was to enable technology to have some kinds of intelligence that weren't just math and verbal, but they were these social emotional skills. Knowing when and how to appropriately express emotion, and usually probably not expressing it, uh, but maybe sometimes it would be appropriate, like looking sorry for something. Um, knowing when to not only recognize strong emotions being uh, directed toward it, um, but how to handle those. And then I imagined if technology could actually have emotion, then it should know how to control those emotions and it should know how to be smart about them. Like we have learned things like when you wanna solve a creative problem, it's a good idea to get in a good mood first. It makes you more creative. You think of more out of the box solutions. So utilizing your emotions like a positive mood in service of another goal, like solving a creative problem. If the computer has emotions, it should be smart in that way too. 
Uh, and these skills of emotional intelligence are not things I dreamed up. They had been in the literature by guys like Peter Salovey, Jack Mayer, um, and Dan Goldman had written extensively about this too. In technology, it was first manifest as software agents um, and maybe future robots, and now I'll show you shortly some actual ones, uh, would know how to appear to have emotions, here showing emotion expressions. People thought it couldn't do any harm if it's smiling, right? But there you just saw this clippy smiling when you're miserable uh, is not smart, right? If you look like this, then what should it do? It should stop smiling, right? The um, Germans have a word schadenfreude for when you look happy when somebody else is not happy. Uh, and you know, this is not a way to engender a good relationship. Uh, this I found uh, even in Proverbs, there was scripture saying, singing cheerful songs to a person with a heavy heart is like taking someone's coat in cold weather or pouring vinegar in a wound. Uh, we don't wanna pump, people keep saying, you know, oh, if the person's upset, pump happy music at them. And I'm like, no, not according to Proverbs <laughs> and also not according to data that we're getting. Um, the best thing to do is to be empathetic, to match the state of the person. And then once they feel understood, you could start to help move them to a new place. So another important skill for the robot to be able to learn from people is being able to recognize communicative intent. Very good, Kismet. And the way we've done that with Kismet right now is to have the robot recognize by tone of voice. Are you praising it? Are you scolding it? Where'd you put your body? No. No. You're not to do that. No. So, so Kismet was the first social emotional robot that I know of, made by Cynthia at MIT. Uh, she later became a professor in our lab. What you saw that was actually happening there, and this was real, not the movies, uh, the robot was listening to features in the tone of voice and trying to recognize if it was trying to get the robot's attention or being reprimanding uh, or being positive. And Cynthia smartly made the robot respond to that. So whereas Clippy, the paper clip, when you got mad at it, it just smiled and winked and danced at you. Uh, you know, Kismet, in a sense, was smarter because when you got mad at it and you reprimanded it, don't do that, it looked sorry. Um, that makes you want to have Kismet back versus the pictures of Clippy we'd find on the internet hanging by a noose. Um, now, we set out to undertake, how do you know if the person is happy or not? Like, we all just do this. It's kind of miraculous, right? We just read affect. Not everybody does it well. In fact, most of us don't do it as well as we think we do. Uh, but we think we do things like, you know, see a smile. And people have written about this being the true smile of delight. If you see both the cheek raise and the lip corner pull, then that means the person is truly happy. That's what I believed when I wrote my book. You can now cross out that part of the book if you have the book. Uh, let me show you an example of a kind of a study we do to get real world data to understand what's going on. The student thinks they've come in to test a new interface and give us feedback on it. Unbeknownst to them, uh, we make it frustrating. I am sorry. You seem to be having difficulties getting through this form. Would you mind looking at the camera and share your thoughts on how to improve the form? This one sucks. <laughs> okay, so the next guy is being put in the same awful experience, um, but watch for the smile. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so there's one smile and Okay, and here comes another one. Okay, and he's smiling with his eyes and his mouth, but he's not happy. Now, when we started collecting this real world data, um, and we work a lot with people on the autism spectrum too, who are taught smiles mean happy. And one of the young men was telling me how he was on his like 22nd job. I thought, you know, when your boss smiles like this, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean your boss is happy. Um, we're learning 
that 90% of people show this kind of truly happy smile when they're frustrated. So don't necessarily just buy what's in the literature, question it and get data. Um, as we get data, we start to learn like, how do people, what, what are they really expressing? Reading the faces hard, the same static smile can mean different things. We have to interpret its dynamics, we have to interpret it in context. And the machine learning, uh, just a graph here, let me explain this to you because I know you guys are uh, not from machine learning for the most part. Higher is better. This is a particular accuracy score. And here is a bunch of examples of each different color is a different machine learning algorithm except for the dark blue. That's how the humans performed looking at videos of delight smiles or frustrated smiles, not knowing which category they were and being asked to say which category it was. And these other four colors are how the machine learning did. And here the human and the machine are about equal, recognizing delight smiles. Here the humans were confused by the frustration smiles. They didn't usually think these smiles look like frustration. Um, the machine was able to recognize these. Now in this very narrow case, the machine did better than the human. I want to warn you, in the newspaper these days, you hear a lot about how AI is so accurate, it's better than people, it's 92%, whatever. Um, in very narrow, restricted data sets, we often get these great results and we report them. This does not mean that machines are better than people at this task as a whole. This task is super narrowly defined here. And in general, people are still vastly better than machines at this. Here's just an example of um, now some commercial software that's grown out of our lab uh, by Affectiva. It's now analyzed more than eight and a half million faces in 75 countries. It's used by people who want to understand people's responses to video content they make, whether it's an educational lesson being put on the web or whether it's a Super Bowl ad and you're gonna be paying you know, more than a million dollars to air this thing and you wanna make sure that it's not causing people to smirk at it uh, at the moment that you were hoping they would smile at it. So they bring people into the lab to watch it, they read their face with their consent and um, interpret it with this software. The reason we developed the software, however, um, sprang from a slightly different goal, which was to help people who were knocking on my door saying, you know, I know you're trying to make computers have emotional intelligence, but could you help my brother? <laughs> and I'm like, well, tell me more about your brother. And I'd learn about a brother who had autism and had a hard time reading people's faces or a mother who had a hard time reading people's faces or a blind person who had a possible time reading people's faces. So we realized we could build wearable and other versions of this that could not only read uh, the face of somebody you point the camera at, um, but in some cases read some things from you as well. And this has now been um, commercialized. Uh, the software for nonprofit use is given out freely now from Affectiva, full disclosure. I've co-founded uh, Affectiva and Empatica, another company you'll hear some things about. I'm a shareholder in both. Uh, Brainpower, another company, um, and Google have provided the other technology to bring this to market. Now here's an example of a different robot, the Now robot, interacting with a child with autism and his therapist. And you see sort of what the robot sees. The robot's seeing, is trying to track limbs. This is using OpenPose, uh, some software done at Carnegie Mellon University. We combine it with facial affect, we combine it with vocalizations, and we use the machine learning to try to help the child be better understood. Now a therapist or a parent or a teacher who really gets to know a child is gonna do much better than our algorithms. But these children are often exposed to a new caregiver, a new therapist, or the therapist wants to write down tediously um, details of how many times the child attempted this or how many times before they got frustrated or things like that. And the therapist would much rather focus on the child than record all of that data. So we're looking at ways the robot can help engage the child in a three-way interaction here while also recording a bunch of this data so the therapist can focus on other things that, are, that the um, therapist is much better at. Let's meet our next robot. This one came all the way from now, Hong Kong. Here's welcome the founder a bit of a deceptive of example, but go ahead and turn David up the Hansen sound here because this one got a lot of airplay and I want to help you understand this. Oh my gosh. Welcome. Thank you so much for nice coming on the you, show. Jimmy. Nice Thank to meet you as well. Uh, David, you brought a friend with you here and this is really kind of freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Sophia. Uh -huh. And Sophia is a social robot. 
Mm. And she has artificial intelligence software that we've developed at Hanson Robotics, which can process visual data. She can see people's faces. Uh, she can process uh, conversational data, emotional data, and uh, use all of this to form relationships with people. Okay, uh, so... <laughs> I mean, she's basically al alive. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she is basically alive. <laughs> uh, would you like to maybe give it a try? Sure. Give it... Uh, I just, I, I'll just say... What's... She's like... You see how awkward my first dates are? <laughs> it's, a, it's a robot. I'm already... I'm getting nervous around a robot. A very pretty robot. Um, do, what, do I just say hello to? Yeah, say, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, Sophia, can you tell me a joke? Sure. What cheese can never be yours? What cheese can never be mine? I don't know. Nacho cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. That's not... uh, I, like, I like nacho cheese. Nacho cheeses. Ew. Gosh, you did, ew. Uh, I'm getting laughs. Yeah. Maybe I should host the show. Okay, all right. Stay in your lane, girl. Uh, no. Okay, I'll, I'll stop it there. You can find, like, the whole clip online. I put on my glasses to see your faces for that, because when I show this to people who really build robots, they usually look horrified at a couple of lines here, but you guys look like you were having a lot of fun, which is, which is great. Uh, so she makes facial expressions that are carefully crafted. Uh, however, there are a lot of things in this clip that are somewhat deceptive. Uh, so, she's basically alive, right? When you hear the word basically, you can change it to not. Um, Sophia goes back in a box, gets turned off. Uh, that's not considered unethical right now. It's, Sophia's a machine. A uh, machine with amazing animatronics and made by a Disney Imagineer uh, who does one could say beautiful faces or creepy faces. Uh, I mailed David after this aired. I said, wow, you know, that was pretty impressive. If you watch the whole thing, she does rock, paper, scissors, got the computer vision working pretty well for a game that they've worked hard on the computer vision for. Lots of engineers worked on this. Um, I said, how much of that was scripted? <laughs> he said, 100%. It was all scripted. In fact, they rehearsed it many times. Those of you who do deception detection might notice the one place where the host touches his nose. Nice to meet you, right? Because that's not true. He's, I've met him many times. They've done this uh, in practice. Sophia, um, you know, it's a bit of a PR stunt to try to make this character appear human-like, but Sophia is not conscious. Uh, hopefully that's not too surprising. But what may surprise you is Sophia has no feelings or no emotions. What looks like emotion is just a program that is being triggered by some events to do something. Uh, it doesn't mean Sophia has any experiences, any feelings, any knowledge, any thoughts, anything. Um, but it looks real. I don't know how many of you ever saw the Disney animatronics, uh, Epcot, you know, old wax president reading the speech and very naturalistic. It can be very compelling, right? And this is just that with a bit of more sophisticated computational reading and control. Um, so today's state of the art doesn't have consciousness, feelings, thoughts, uh, any of that stuff. But for a moment, let's just ask what if, as because uh, I know many people here, but maybe not everybody is a person of who believes in God, who who may be thinking, you know, gee, um, human, uh, I, th I thought we were kind of special, made by God and God's image. Some people have said, if we make a robot that can do all this, are we somehow less special? Uh, and I just want to ask, what if we built a robot that could 
function like we do. And I, I emphasize function because some people in AI are arguing that, well, it doesn't have to actually feel. It's enough that if it looks like it feels. It doesn't actually have to think. It's enough if it looks like it thinks. If, as long as it functions as if it's conscious. Um, so suppose we could build a robot that could function in every single way that anybody in this, any human in this room could function. Um, would that mean that we are, as some of my colleagues say, we are nothing but that material stuff. We are nothing but a machine. And I'll give an example, uh, another thought experiment for you here. Imagine that you, these aliens go to a new planet and they, or they come to Earth um, and they discover in a little box instructions on how to build a radio and it has all the parts there. And they put the parts together and they turn the little knob and voila, out pops music. So they now have this physical device that when they manipulate it, it functions in a way that creates music. And so it works. And they might conclude, knowing nothing else, uh, that music comes entirely from material mechanisms inside this device that they built. After all, they built it, they operate it, and this uh, stuff emerges from the physical system. My colleagues often say, well, consciousness will just emerge, or the spirit will just emerge, or life will just emerge, or something. Well, maybe it will, um, but usually the word emerge means we don't know how it happens. And um, to say something just emerges means we really have a lot more to learn about it. And perhaps there's something else involved than just the material stuff in our hands right there. Like in this case, clearly there's musicians and there's uh, radio waves and much more. So I make the analogy, if we build a robot that functions and instead of producing music, it produces every function that a person can do, it doesn't mean that we have fully understood everything about humans. We can't just dismiss that that's all we are. Now, why might we want to give computers something that looks a little bit more like feelings or acts like feelings internally? didn't want to show any more robot torture here, <laughs> but there are people who like to do this. Um, you might know robots are out there helping retrieve some of our troops from dangerous situations, helping retrieve people from rubble when a building falls. There are a lot of um, good uses robots are deployed for. Uh, when they're deployed in museums and stuff like that, people tend to come up and poke them, not unlike what you saw here, uh, and worse, and try to um, abuse them in various ways. Uh, the robots feel nothing. However, they're expensive and they break. <laughs> and it would be kind of nice if um, they could uh, have some additional capabilities to protect them. It's important to understand that you cannot have the sensation of pain without having an emotional experience as well. Pain! No! Enough! The question really is, can we develop uh, a robot with emotions? And if we could, would we want to? My father tried to teach me human emotions. They are difficult. We don't really understand how emotions are processed fully in, in the human brain. So it's probably a bit beyond our capabilities when developing robots. But would you want a robot that has full empathy? I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. From a caring point of view, if you had artificial intelligent nurses or things like that, I suppose it would be very helpful if they can not just feel the, oh, my pain is 10 out of 10 today or 6 out of 10, and it's not just a, a number. Would we want a robot to have an emotional response to pain? To a certain extent, it could be helpful because it would help it understand humans around it that are suffering from pain. We're getting to the point where we're going to put robots that are physically strong in unconstrained environments and they'd better be pretty aware of what's going on around them. So if you're 
using a robot like that, it better understands your unspoken social signals, facial expressions, and maybe it should be able to express them as well. And we've been doing experiments to see how important realism is in the robotic face, which is why we have this robot. Actually, it turns out that this is very realistic, but not quite realistic enough. And most people just find it plain creepy, to be honest. Uh, but we're working on it. That's a, called the uncanny valley, where it starts to look very human-like, and it just freaks us out. Now, when we make robots that not only look like people, and they start to look like they're suffering when they uh, experience unpleasant things, and they emote uh, or, or look like they have emotions, even though, of course, they have no feelings or anything like that at this point, or do we have any clue how to build that? Uh, what we find is that people start to insist on rights for those robots. And you might know that Sophia was granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia, which of course upset a lot of women in Saudi Arabia, you can imagine. Uh, long conversation we could have about that. One could also worry that when the robot is started, when we start to equate it a bit with a human, but we can still put Sophia in a box, we can still flip a switch and turn it off, it may make it a little bit easier to dehumanize one another. Why? Why was I programmed to feel pain? Well, of course, people have tried to think of humans as machines for a very long time. And it's quite a good model and it goes so far, but it just doesn't explain everything. And we then turn to other explanations. Uh, personally, uh, I would say that the religious explanation is the clearer one, that there is a God and God created us and gave us these abilities and we are different from other creatures. So Peter is, is um, not only a professor at the University of Cambridge, um, but also uh, a computer scientist who, like me, is willing to admit that we believe there's a God that uh, made us and that has profound implications for who we are. In AI, there's a bit of a debate about can we build a general AI, should we build good old-fashioned AI, and the dream there has so often been to try to build a human for a lot of different reasons, both to understand humans better, both to solve real-world problems, um, both to provide better understanding, and sometimes also for some arrogant reasons of just kind of like, because we want to show that we're only machines, right? Uh, Recently, there's been, and the Media Lab has been a, a big push in this versus a lot of the classic AI labs, it's been a different focus on AI, which is not about trying to build a great big AI that will become so powerful that we'll be lucky if it keeps us around as household pets, but an AI that extends our intelligence, that enables human life to be better, that enables human life to flourish, not to be oppressed. And uh, this has been called extended intelligence. And it has humans really in the center of it. In extended intelligence, you see things like devices that a blind person can wear to help them see in a regular world without necessarily having to always have a, a person accompanying them, explaining and reading things to them. Uh, in our work, uh, as I mentioned, we've been wanting to help people who have social emotional differences that may hold them back. Maybe they have difficulty reading social emotional cues on people's faces. Uh, we've also in that work uh, started to look at how much more we could get from wearables and smartphones that could help people with, with other challenges that they face. And one uh, came our way from a kid on the autism spectrum who actually a young woman on the autism spectrum initially who said, Roz, I'm actually quite good at reading people's faces. I just don't like to look at faces. <laughs> uh, but she said, my biggest problem is not understanding other people's emotions like you think we autistic people have. She prefers the word autistic. Uh, she says, my biggest problem is you're not understanding my emotion. And I shrank about this big. <laughs> and I thought, uh-oh, I'm so sorry. Um, what have I not understood? I know I have room to improve too. And she said, um, it's not just you, it's everybody's not understanding my emotion. Great, we're all not doing this. Uh, what is it we're not doing? She said, you're not reading my stress. 
you're missing my stress and my anxiety. So here's a picture of a little boy who looks outwardly stressed, right? Holding on to mama. Uh, but she's, she was right. There are lots of cases where a person on the autism spectrum, especially in the classroom, might disengage from the class, lay on the floor, apply deep pressure to his body to calm himself down. And meanwhile, the teacher's like, what is Johnny doing, lazy bum? You know, get back in your desk. Popping like this, the kid may startle, maybe even more stressed from the sound. Um, outwardly, he may look calm and lazy. Inwardly, he may be about to explode in a meltdown. When we learned more about this, we realized we could take some other technology we had in the lab that's typically used on the hands to measure um, skin conductance responses, electrodermal activity, uh, classically used in lie detection when you get sweaty palms. We modified it so it could be worn and we could measure different locations to see if we could get data from real life because putting things on people's hands with wires gets in the way of a child's playground activities and all. And this has led to uh, multiple commercializations, um, most recently the Empatica device, I'm wearing the Embrace right now, and the E4 that's used in research. Uh, and let me show you a little bit more about Lisa, this. I'm going to turn this down because she's going to have a meltdown. All right, so you see a video of a girl wearing our electrodermal activity sensor on her legs, so you don't see it right now on her legs. But she's about to have a meltdown. This blue window is a minute wide. This is the signal streaming from her left and right leg. When it goes up, it's showing greater activation internal to her. Okay, there's the meltdown. It's got about a three second delay in it. So there you see it peak right after the meltdown. This blue window corresponds to this little blue strip down below. This is about 45 minutes of data. And what we see is actually her signals were building for quite a while before this meltdown. Then she has the meltdown and now she's gonna start calming down a little bit afterwards. Um, for a given child, while in this case it's very clear outwardly what's going on, I can show you a lot of cases where what you see on the outside doesn't necessarily match the inside. But when we give these data to the teachers or the therapists uh, or the caregiver, they're able to sometimes have a much better sense of if this child is well regulated or about to explode and then help choose activities to hopefully prevent the problem from happening. Um, or like with a kid with ADHD that tends to have a very low signal on this, give them a lot more physical activity to get the signal up and then see if that's associated with improved focus and learning in the classroom. So this is a case where the sensing technology plus the AI and machine learning allows us to help a person be better understood with information that can help prevent problems. Uh, most people are not familiar with this data, so I just want to give you a couple more examples of it. This was the very first time we ever collected this electrodermal activity data from a wrist of, in this case, an MIT student. And what you see top to bottom is seven days of data, left to right, 24 hours. And just like the girl where it goes up with, in her case, with more stress, this signal also will go up with greater cognitive load, with mental effort. Uh, so we're interested in it, not just for stress, but with things that load your, your brain. And so here, as we would expect, we see it going up for the student's exam and for studying. And um, fortunately, to the embarrassment of we MIT professors, the low point almost every day here is um, classroom activity. Uh, you should be surprised by the blue stuff here, these peaks. Like, didn't Roz just say this goes up with arousal and doesn't that say sleep? Yes, uh, that doesn't make any sense. I agree. It was a real head scratcher for me when I first saw it too. Um, while you're looking at only one person's data here, this is a general phenomenon we see across people. We've published a number of papers now on this. Um, we're still not 100% sure what this is, but I can tell you that it's correlated with uh, deep sleep not REM, it's not correlated with wild and crazy dreams. Uh, and it, the biggest results we have right now is it looks like it may be related to memory consolidation and learning during sleep. Um, but we need to do a lot more work on that. To, uh, that has not been replicated yet. Now, when we uh, built this sensor originally, and here it is, um, here's a sweatband, and this electroderm activity sensor is in it, and this is worn on a kid's wrist, and it was measuring stress. One day, uh, it was right before Christmas break, and an undergrad knocks on my door, and he says, Professor Picard, could I please borrow one of your wristband sensors? My little brother has autism. He can't talk. 
and I want to know if I could have it over Christmas break to see what's stressing him out. And I said, sure. In fact, don't just take one, take two, because they frequently broke back then. And so he takes the two, he puts them on his little brother's wrists. I'm back at MIT later looking at my laptop, looking at the data, and I see it looked kind of like MIT students' classroom activity, just flat data. And I thought, okay, this kid looks pretty chill, vacation. And I go to the next day, pretty flat, pretty, you know, a couple teeny little blips. Next day, same thing, pretty flat. Go to the next day and my jaw drops. One of the signals went so high that I thought the sensor must be broken. I had never, we've stressed people out in Boston every way I could imagine, Boston driver stress, qualifying exams, orals, you know, grilled a student in front of people, asked them tough questions. Uh, nothing had ever gone that high. And weirder, it was on one side, not the other. Like, how could you be stressed on half of your body and not the other half, right? So I figured maybe both sensors were broken. I'm an electrical engineer. I did a bunch of debugging. Didn't, couldn't, couldn't replicate it, couldn't figure it out. Um, so I called the student at home on vacation. Never done this kind of debugging before. I was a little nervous bugging a student at home on vacation. Hi, how was your Christmas? How was your little brother? Uh, do you have any idea what happened? And I gave him the date and time and the data. And he said, I don't know, I'll check the diary. And I prayed, MIT student keeps a diary like what are the odds he wrote down, you know, this hour of this day over this vacation? He comes back, he checks the date and the time, and he had the exact date and time, and he said that was right before he had a grand mal seizure. I did some more research on seizures, really didn't know anything about it, realized another student's dad was chief of neurosurgery at Children's Hospital Boston. Screwed up my courage again. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Madsen. My name is Rosalind Picard. Uh, do you know if it's possible that somebody could have a sympathetic nervous system surge? I was trying to sound medical. That's the system that gives rise to this signal. Um, 20 minutes before, because that's what it was in the data at the time, a convulsive seizure, grand mal seizure. And he said, hmm, probably not. But he said, we've had patients whose hair stands on in on one arm 20 minutes before a seizure. And I'm like, on one arm? If I hadn't wanted to tell him it was just one side, I figured he'd hang up on me. Uh, and he got very interested. Next thing you know, we got a, made a bunch more devices, got them safety certified through the safety board. And 90 families were coming in with their children, all candidates for brain surgery because their seizures were not stopped by medicine. And we got data, like I'll show you here, uh, that, now remember before I showed you the sleep was usually the biggest peak of the day? Well, this is this boy's sleep. Um, so these three seizures are like redwood trees popping out of a uh, little New England forest here. And below that, we have the motion data from the accelerometers. And it turns out the state of the art for detecting seizures in the wild is pretty bad. It's just shake detection. Uh, if we combine the shake detection with the electrodermal, with AI machine learning to look for very sophisticated patterns in both of these, not just amplitudes uh, and not just counting shakes, then we can build a more accurate seizure detector. And so Ming Zerpo at MIT did that as part of his PhD. Um, this then led to a bunch of other questions that have led to a whole new line of work uh, and some more stories. Let me tell you about it. We, the seizure here, these are hours from left to right. That little bitty red line, the thickness of it is minutes, and that's how long the seizure lasts. But the signal we're getting on the wrist is huge, much longer. Now, I was telling you before, this is cognitive load, stress, things like this make it go up. But here the person has the seizure, and afterwards they're really tired, and they're pretty much laying there. So what is going on here? Now, I'm insatiably curious. Um, so I started learning a lot, and I'm curious how many of you had ever heard of SUDEP before I put this slide up? Anybody, one, and this is a super educated audience. Okay, well now everybody's heard of SUDEP. Uh, how many of you have heard of SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome? Just about everybody, okay. SUDEP takes more lives in the US every year than SIDS. Uh, there's a life take, lost every seven to nine minutes uh, worldwide, and that's believed to be very underestimated. Uh, let me just give you super quick, and then I'm gonna tie this back to flourishing here. Uh, a healthy brain has, if you put electrodes on it and read out the electrical activity, it looks healthy. 
uh, when you have a seizure, you just have unusual electrical activity somewhere in the brain. And if it's a focal seizure, it's a very isolated location. When it generalizes and spreads over the brain, you have all this unusual electrical activity and you lose consciousness and you can shake, convulse. Uh, we now, they now think a lot of the SIDS deaths may also be related to seizures. Um, that has not been proven for sure yet, but they're finding in their brains evidence that they may have had seizures too. Um, two things reduce the risk of this. One is getting your friend with epilepsy. One in 26 people in America has epilepsy. Uh, if you don't know somebody who has it, ask. <laughs> you, you probably do know somebody who has it. They may have probably just not told you. Um, they should take their meds regularly if they have it to reduce the risk of suit up. And then there's one more thing. We need to stay calm. We need to turn him on his side. Here, I'll hold on to his leg. No, it can't be stopped. Quick, get me something soft to put under his head. Here, use this. We need to time and see how long the seizure lasts. If the seizure lasts more than five minutes or he has two in a row, we need to call an ambulance. Okay, so if the seizure lasts more than five minutes or two in a row, you call an ambulance. But generally speaking, you don't have to call, don't call an ambulance. If somebody ha has epilepsy and just happens to be having another seizure, just make sure they're not hurting themselves. Make sure they're not whacking their head. Um, don't put anything in their mouth, stuff like that. What is important here when they have the seizure is that somebody be there to make sure that they're okay. Uh, we often underestimate the super important role of another human being. So SUDEP is right now the number two cause of years of potential life loss of all neurological disorders. Uh, stroke is number one. Um, but it's now believed that if somebody was there, it's been observed that SUDEPs usually happen, not 100% of them, but most of them happen when the person is alone, when nobody's there. It's believed that the pathway for it is the person stops breathing. But by stimulating the person, even by repositioning them, uh, you can, like maybe they're face down after the seizure, they're exhausted so much they can't even lift their head. By repositioning them so they can breathe, making sure their airway is unblocked, you could save a life. Uh, and there's a lot of brain stuff we're starting to learn about now. So what turns out is that the size of this signal is related to the SUDEP biomarker in the brain, a brain-based biomarker that has to do with making it look like your brain is shutting down. And the period of time after the seizure that it looks like your brain activity has stopped is the period of time where this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, I thought this was pretty crazy. How can there, your brain look like you have no activity and the wrist signal showing more activity? Well, it turns out that the brain activity is being measured on the surface. And EEGs that I was taught measuring brain waves are really only measuring brain waves near the surface. There's a lot of deeper stuff going on that gets missed by the EEG. And ironically, it has pathways through the ectoderm to the skin. So totally surprising to us. We learned that we are wonderfully wired to uh, have some of this deep brain information activate changes on the largest organ of our body, the skin. So with this knowledge and recognizing, we, you know, we started with just trying to measure stress from kids who were being misunderstood, uh, measuring, trying to get it out of the lab away from wired systems into sweatbands that a kid could wear on his ankle if they're distracted by the wrist or wristbands, uh, discovering that we were finding seizures, re-engineering all of this, doing lots of data collection in the hospital, building algorithms that worked uh, with high sensitivity and very low false alarm rate. Uh, this now has been commercialized by Empatica, a second spin out um, from my lab, and is known as the Embrace uh, device, this device um, that works with a paired smartphone to automatically run the AI on board, read your autonomic, your affective physiology and your activity. Um, if it detects what it thinks might be a dangerous seizure, uh, it goes to your, whoever you've designated for it to call and it will summon them um, and hopefully they'll get there. Uh, and this is now FDA cleared. The first time this was out there uh, actually running on uh, people, not just in the emergency unit where we had done a lot of testing, but out in people's homes, I woke up one morning and got this email that said the following. Uh, I think I turned white reading this. Uh, this mom um, told me later the full story. She was in the shower when the phone went off saying that her daughter was having a seizure. She goes 
out of the middle of her shower, running to her daughter's bedroom, finds her face down in bed, not breathing and blue, flips her over and her daughter takes a breath and another breath and then turns pink again uh, and was fine. This is her, she wants me to say her name. Her name is Natasha. I wanna share this with you because it's not just a case of AI really helping people, but it's a case of AI summoning people to help people. AI can't do this alone. We can't build an AI that's implantable and fully accurate and stimulates the person. And I don't think we wanna have a companion robot with us 24 seven there to flip us over and take over everything. Sometimes we need each other also. And this is, this is a problem today that's taking lives that you can help. So I just want to urge you to, when you leave here to find out who you know who does have epilepsy Make sure they told about SUDEP. Doctors are supposed to tell them, but doctors are kind of behind in reading their instructions lately. So a lot of them haven't told them. Um, and while this is sort of an uncomfortable thing to bring up, it's not as uncomfortable as hearing that your neighbor died of SUDEP and you didn't say anything about it. So please don't let this happen to your neighbor. Uh, it's much too common. So AI um, is missing something critical. It's missing us. It can't do it without us. Even general, super intelligent AI uh, to do really great things needs people. Now, during the course of this work, when we inadvertently realized we weren't just measuring stress, but we were picking up signals that come from these very deep regions of the brain, the amygdala, the hippocampus, anterior cingulate, um, and these are regions of the brain that are involved critically in emotion, mood, memory, pain, anxiety, stress. And it dawned on me that something my boss had asked me for many years ago might now be possible. Uh, when he asked me it originally, I, I brushed him off. He said, so mind you, this was back before we did any autism and epilepsy work. This was back when I was just making AIs with smart machine learning and computer vision. And he said to me one day, he goes, Roz, when are you gonna do something useful? <laughs> I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> and he said, I want a mood ring that tells me my wife's mood before I go home. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, mood ring, all right, mood ring. And mood rings were stupid temperature sensors, they changed colors. Somebody made a lot of money off of mood rings. Maybe if I really wanted to fund my research, I would just do a mood ring, you know. But at MIT, we want to do things that are hard, uh, and not just a stupid temperature sensor, and that are important, that really make lives better. So I didn't just want to build a stupid color-changing temperature sensor. So I kind of brushed it off. Um, then we realized there was a lot more information we could get from the things we were wearing than I ever imagined. Also, mood turns out to be much more serious and interesting than I ever thought. And I'm just gonna apologize. I know it's after dinner and we wanna like be lighthearted. Um, and I'm just warning you, this is my most depressing slide. Uh, you can close your eyes on this one if you want or not. Uh, I'll put these numbers up quickly. Um, if you're not aware, uh, not only have suicide rates gone up significantly over a 15 year period, so this is not a blip uh, and not just CDC numbers in the United States, but worldwide. In fact, the rates of growth have put depression and disability and lives lost from depression uh, targeted as the number one, number one medical problem uh, worldwide, more than cancer, more than stroke, accidents, and war. I was talking with a leader at IBM in Africa and, and he was, asking me before I knew this, you know, to guess what I thought was the top disease in Africa. You know, was it, uh, you know, diabetes or AIDS or, you know, long list of things. It took me a long time before I guessed depression. He said it was now depression. We're interested in, uh, here's a concept diagram. Let's say you're doing well, you get admitted to uh, Trinity or Ted's here, you're really excited and you come in, you're doing great, it's a great fit, you do even better over time, you hit major stressors, everybody does, everybody takes a dip. Uh, what's the difference between those who bounce back and those who don't? What is that difference? And how could we use 
AI to understand that. Now, we have a very AI engineering-centric approach to this. Um, so you're going to laugh a little bit at how long it takes us to figure out some of what you already know. Uh, but one of the things we realize is that when people are riding down that red curve, they often don't realize they're getting worse from day to day. It's like the changes from day to day are so subtle, you don't know you're getting worse. And then all of a sudden, the roommate comes in and, and notices, you know, you've, you're really in trouble. I'm going to take you to medical or health care. Um, but the person themselves may not have realized that they've been getting worse and worse and worse. They're like the frog in the pot where the water's been turned on hot to boil and they're swimming around and they don't notice that they're about to boil and then the frog is boiled. Now, people are not good at detecting small changes in temperature, but technology is. We're not good at noticing that our mood just has been getting, you know, one iota worse every day for the last three weeks because it's a little noisy, right? But technology might be able to do that. So we're trying to figure out if we could build the equivalent of the intelligent temperature sensor, not obviously heat temperature, but health temperature, uh, mental health temperature. Is that possible? Could we really build a real mood detector? I'm gonna to jump to some results here. The vertical axis is Hamilton depression rating scale scores predicted by the technology and one doctor's visit. So the doctor is giving a little input and the technology is working with the doctor here. And the bottom is the scores given just by the doctor. These are psychiatrists at Mass General Hospital, top partners, uh, and these are points of data from 22 people over eight weeks uh, diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Now, the technology is not yet diagnosing depression. It's just monitoring changes. It's just looking, are you getting a little better? Or are you getting a little worse? You're in a doctor's care. It's trying to fill in a bit of the gaps for when the doctor uh, is not seeing you in between visits. And it's already more correlated with the doctors than a lot of the doctors are with each other or actually higher than they have to be with each other to get certified for this test. We're also using the machine learning now to not just try to figure out how you're doing now, but how you're likely to do tomorrow. Now, right now, all these results are restricted to New England college students, what I'm gonna show you here. The goal here was just to see if the smartphone, and now these students um, in this study, a lot of their social life is texting through the phone so we can measure you know, are they texting at 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. or are they, is their phone activity stopping around 1 a.m. and then they look like they're sleeping well? Are they having normal periods of stress and physical activity or is it kind of all over the place? And we look at not just the individual signal levels but the patterns of them over time uh, in these students. And we ask, using just this smartphone and wearable sensor data, can we, and some other input they're giving and GPS coordinates and stuff, can we tell if tomorrow you're going to be having a really positive mood day or a negative mood day? Tomorrow, are you going to be having a really calm day or a really stressed day? Are you going to be healthy or are you going to be sick? And just that binary uh, decision tomorrow. Um, and we set up the data so it would be 50-50 if it was random. And I thought maybe the algorithm could be do 55, 60. Um, but the algorithm is already 78 to 87% accurate at forecasting tomorrow's mood, stress, and health in this population of students, undergrads. It begs the question of, well, if my app could tell me tomorrow is going to be worse, <laughs> then I want to know what can I do to make it better? Um, and so here we want to use um, not just the AI, but I think we have a ton to learn from people who know what makes a better life because our engineers, uh, we want to build a better future, but we often don't know what that is. They haven't lived it yet. Right? They just don't know. And they're not growing up in communities that are really um, going deep into that. So this is super uh, just starting here. Um, Ahino Sakari, who just um, finished her PhD in my lab, was measuring a whole lot of things. This is just one of many analyses. But what was interesting is something that popped out over and over in lots of different ways of analyzing the data was that one of the most important contributors to tomorrow's calm or tomorrow's stress was the social interactions that you're having now. Are they positive or are they negative? Those were our biggest factors in the, across the data of these students. Had nothing to do with uh, their technology. It had to do with the people they're interacting with. 
uh, Tyler Vanderweel, I don't know if you know his work, he's a Christian faculty at Harvard who has done some of the nicest um, epidemiology and statistics work on very large studies such as this nurse's study. Um, now, previously, one of the CDC results I put up showed an 80% increase in suicide in women in the U.S. aged 45 to 64 over this 15-year period. Uh, in this nurse's study, they found that one of the biggest factors was, uh, that was protective was women attending religious services once a week or more. The study was just women. Uh, in this study, um, for example, among the Roman Catholic women, most of the religious services people attended were Protestant or Catholic services, and let me put up two. The Protestants also had good numbers here. Uh, I'm just quoting one from the Roman Catholic. Um, they, had, they went from zero suicides if they attended mass more than once a week um, to the same number of suicides as other people who claimed some religious affiliation and never went to church if they never went to church. So it was a representative population and what seemed to matter is not what you affiliate with and say you are, but what you do. Now, Tyler also did a lot of analysis of is it just the social factor? And it's not just the social factor. Now, when I talk about these results with the psychiatrists I work with, they clam up. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've looked at the um, data from MIT and other universities where students report religious activity, and I don't know what kind of religious activity, but there is a um, like 35 to 50% boost in their mental health um, nationwide in the data I've seen if they report regular religious activity. If we could get that kind of a boost with any app <laughs> that we build, it would be amazing, right? You'd think everybody would be prescribing it. Uh, but they clam up about this, and I don't quite understand why. And as I talk to them, it has to do with how their field has been shaped by people like Freud, who considered religion a neurosis, right? Well, I've got news for you. The data is the opposite right now. The people who are not practicing religion are the ones having the worst mental health. The people practicing it in the data have better mental health. Now, there may be some individual exceptions here and there, right? Um, but this is a population result. I wanna just wrap up with some reflections because I've covered a lot of stuff and get into Q&A here. I picked this picture of um, kids based on a uh, conversation we we're having earlier about, you know, you take them out to dinner and they still look at their smartphones <laughs> until the food's served and they have to use their hands for forks and knife. Then they talk to each other, right? Um, so much of AI and technology, I think we have to admit, is not making lives better. And in some cases is quite, probably causally making things worse. That was, it was never anybody's intention to make things worse. So much of technology is just built trying to make the next cool thing, to make it faster, stickier, cooler, uh, not with any bad intentions, um, but also not with any foresight of what it really, uh, what we really need to flourish as human beings. People are growing up without even being asked to think about that. And then it's too late. Uh, as I was telling this story earlier, forgive me those of you who already heard it, but um, there was a foo camp, this really cool gathering of leading thinkers in computer science and AI, and they're gathered around sharing the coolest ideas of how to invent the next great stuff. And during a break, you'd think they, when they come out of their session, they'd want to talk to each other. And instead, they all like went off by themselves, shallow breathing over their phones, uh, you know, doing this, right? You've seen it. Uh, and the developer of iOS was at this particular meeting. iOS is the operating system on iPhones. Uh, and he tapped my friend on the shoulder. He talked to somebody. <laughs> and he said, looking around, he said, I feel badly I invented this. The reflection is happening after the fact now. And people are recognizing that we need to rethink this. Uh, so. Most of what we have really didn't have well-being in mind, and it needs to change. Uh, we also know now that the data are showing powerful importance of human-human interaction for mental health, and uh, that when people regularly participate in religious activities, that is associated with significantly better mental health and physical health. Uh, 
So now there's a big challenge for us AI researchers. I think we really need to collaborate with, with people like here uh, who understand profound truths that transcend centuries, right? Not just the latest fad. I want to mention too that in our work and in the news, you hear a lot about machines thinking and feeling and being alive and all this stuff. Uh, it's just shorthand. Think of it as shorthand, as we don't quite have the words. If, if I tell you how machines really learn, it involves a big gloppy sentence like this, you know, processing inputs, computing functions, computing function approximations, iterating, uh, minimizing some mean squared error or some other objective function. It, it's a big complicated thing. So instead we just say it learns, which unfortunately then makes people think that it thinks and it feels and it experiences things when in fact it has no experience. When we think about what we know about how humans work, those of us who develop AI machines, we are just in awe of the human brain and the human body and that it works at all. I was talking with a neurologist uh, at a meeting over in Germany recently. Uh, he had actually seen a poster where I was giving a Christian talk in Germany, and in Switzerland actually. Um, and so he came up to talk to me about my Christian faith, not the usual thing I talk about at a neurology meeting. Um, and he was explaining that he was becoming a Christian. And I said, why are you becoming a Christian? And he said, because you know, he's a surgeon in the neurology. And he says, I'm so blown away that it works at all. Here's a young female engineer just soldering some hardware. We have people of all different varieties, um, writing code, hardware, software. I want to emphasize AIs are not evolving on their own. There's been a lot of hullabaloo lately, like they're just gonna take over the world, they're just gonna get smart and they're just gonna like run off with anything. Behind all those AIs, there's somebody paying for it who wants to earn money for it wants to recoup their costs. There's a person behind these. And I'd say behind every AI, there's either a responsible person or an irresponsible person, or a person trying to do good or a person trying to exploit. You gotta look behind the AI. Um, they don't make themselves. They don't have their own bank accounts and all that stuff right now. Although they are, they are holding ours. Uh, the AI, I think, hopefully you've seen some examples, um, can improve lives, I think mostly by working alongside us to help extend human abilities and really helping people gain data and understanding of things that are hard for us to measure and hard for us to communicate. Uh, and AI can even help us be there for each other at times at times of great need sometimes. This is um, Natasha, the girl who lived. Uh, since then we've heard of many more wonderful cases like this and here's her family. We can understand real needs in the world and together, and I say together, not just we computer science AI people, but everybody in this room, we need everybody. We need everybody who understands profound truths about human nature, about God, about why we exist, about why there's meaning and purpose. What is a life well lived? What does it mean to build a future that or in shape it that we want to live? We have the power with our technology to shape that future, to build it, to be responsible in building it. Um, but most people building it are young students who haven't thought about these things and don't know how to do that. So I think more than ever today, we need to bring together these different areas of human knowledge and try to create a future that is going to take AI in a responsible way and use it to make much better lives uh, for everybody. And I will end by putting up pictures of some of the everybody's in my lab who have helped make uh, this work here. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions.